In the exercise that you are about to do now, we will use model selection as a way of looking for signs of selection in a set of uh, viral sequences. So how will we do that? Well, as I discussed in the lecture on uh, model selection, the way to use this as a way of answering scientific questions is that you start out by coming up with a number of t alternative uh, hypotheses about the system you're looking at, phrasing each hypothesis in the form of a mathematical model. In the case of phylogeny, that's as a probabilistic model. And then you assess evidence for the different hypotheses using, for instance, the Akaike information criterion and model probabilities, which will then tell you how much belief you should have in the different possible models and the different possible hypotheses. So if what we're interested in is looking for signs of selection in a set of DNA sequences, we will therefore have to come up with some alternative hypotheses, some models assuming selection, some models not assuming selection, and each of those have to be phrased as mathematical models. So how would we make a substitution model in this case, for instance, that either assumed or did not assume uh, selection going on in a set of sequences? That's the, the challenge here. The way that this is typically done is based on the uh, on the redundancy of the genetic code. As you know, presumably, we have 20 different amino acids uh, that make up all the possible proteins. But in the genetic code, we have 61 codons encoding these 20 amino acids. The last three are, of course, the stop codons of the 64 possible codons. This means that most amino acids are encoded by more than one codon. A large group of amino acids have, for instance, four different codons that encode them. This means that some DNA mutations are silent. Some DNA mutations will not change the encoded amino acid. Such silent or pseudonymous mutations generally do not have a huge impact on organismal fitness. They will not change the encoded protein and therefore they will not change that important aspect of, of how the cell metabolism works. For instance, you will still get the same sugar degrading protein even though you have a silent uh, mutation at the DNA level. There can be some effects if you are mutating something that has an impact on translation efficiency or maybe on, on some other aspect of, of DNA replication or, or whatever. But typically, those effects are orders of magnitude less than the effects of actually changing proteins. Bottom line is, you can use the difference between silent and non-silent mutations as a way of looking for effects of selection. And you will do that in the following manner. I will need to first introduce some terminology, and then I'll explain the model that we use to look for selection. So let's say you have some DNA sequence like the one I've indicated at the bottom of the slide. It's a protein coding DNA sequence. I've written it up as a number of codons, and let's start by focusing on this one codon, CTA, which encodes leucine, and that sits somewhere in the sequence. Now, if you take the last position, the third codon position in this codon, and consider what could happen to that in terms of mutation, it could mutate, it's an A, and it could therefore mutate to either C, G, or T. As it turns out, both all of these three alternative mutated codons also encode leucine. That's how it often is. If you mutate the third codon position, you will often get the same amino acid. We therefore refer to this site as a synonymous nucleotide site. Okay? No matter what happens, no matter what mutation hits this particular uh, nucleotide site, it won't change the amino acid. Okay, let's look now at the middle position of the codon, the T. The T can mutate to an A, a C, or a G. As it turns out, all of these three alternative codons encode different amino acids. And that, incidentally, is also the way that the genetic code generally is. If you mutate codon position number two in an amino acid, uh, in, a, in, a, in a codon, then you will always get a different amino acid. We therefore refer to this particular site as a non-synonymous nucleotide site. No matter what happens on this site, you will get a different amino acid out of it. Finally, the first position, the C, that can mutate to an A, a G, or a T. It turns out that TTA also encodes leucine, but the other two codons do not. This is because leucine is one of those amino acids that have six different codons that encode it, and this particular one happens to also be, be one of them. 
We therefore refer to the first side here as being one-third synonymous. If you mutate to a T, you will get no amino acid change. And two-thirds non-synonymous, the other two mutations, will change the amino acid. So you could imagine we could do this for the entire protein coding sequence. For each site, we could count, is it synonymous, is it non-synonymous, or is it part synonymous and part non-synonymous. After we had done that for the entire nucleotide sequence, we would have a count of the fraction of synonymous sites or mutations and the fraction of possible non-synonymous mutations. And this would in fact tell us the random probability that if we take any different, any random nucleotide here and change it to something uh, random, what is the probability that we will get a, random, a, a synonymous change or non-synonymous change. If, for instance, as is mostly the case, that we find that, say, 66% of all the sites are uh, of all the possible mutations are, are non-synonymous, then that means that by randomly changing a single nucleotide to something else, there's a 66% chance of getting an amino acid change. That's what these numbers are telling us. Now, based on that terminology, we now define, define the two uh, following important terms, DN and DS. DN is the rate of non-synonymous mutations, meaning the number of non-synonymous, the number of amino acid changing mutations happening per time, divided by the number of non-synonymous sites. Okay, so this is a way of normalizing this measure. DS, similarly, is the rate of synonymous mutations, the rate of silent mutations, number of silent mutations per time, divided by the number of synonymous sites. Again, we're normalizing here. This means, because of the way that we've defined DN and DS here, we would actually expect, if you have a piece of DNA and you just randomly change uh, nucleotides completely randomly, then we would actually expect that DN and DS would have equal values, that they would, that the DN divided by DS, that's another way of saying it, would be equal to one. Why would we expect that? Well, we would expect that because of the way we defined it, sorry. So what happens when the, if we have a DNA data set and we do not get the same values for DN and DS, if we get a DN DS ratio that's different from one? Well, it turns out that that will probably only happen if we have head selection. And why is that? Well, it's because of the following. Recall, we can think of evolution as a two-step process. First, you have mutation, which we generally assume to be random. A random nucleotide is changed somewhere in the DNA sequence. That's then followed by selection, which is non-random. If the nucleotide destroys something, if it leads to a lower fitness, then that individual will, will maybe not survive or it won't have offspring, and over time that mutation will not be seen. If a mutation somehow increases functionality, then that individual will have a greater fitness, it will leave more offspring, and over time we will see that particular mutation. So, randomly changing DNA, by definition, will lead to a DNDS ratio of 1. Deviations from a DNDS ratio of 1 must therefore be caused by selection. And this is how we can use modeling to find selection. If we come up with a substitution model, which has as one of its parameters the DNDS ratio, we then fit a model to the data, estimate the DNDS ratio, and find that the value is significantly different from one, then that is in itself evidence that we have selection going on. That's how we will do it in the exercise. Specifically, if we find that the DNDS ratio is less than one, meaning that DN is smaller than DS, we see fewer uh, amino acid changes uh, than expected. This is a sign of what we call negative or purifying selection. It's not that the amino acid changing mutations aren't happening, they are happening with some random rate, it's just that they are selected against because these mutations are perhaps destroying the proteins folding or function in some manner. If we find a DNDS ratio that's larger than one, on the other hand, it's an indication of what we call positive selection. We're now seeing more amino acid changes than we would expect. Again, this is not because we don't have all the silent mutations that, that uh, would typically happen. It's just that they somehow are removed by selection or that the others are, are uh, uh, increased by selection.
This is the type of model we will use in the exercise, and we will use it, as I say, to look for positive selection in viral sequences, in particular in HIV. So I've collected a set of HIV data that we have from a number of patients. Uh, the DNA sequences are from a gene that encodes an important surface protein on the virus particle called GP120. This protein is uh, responsible for the virus particle binding to the target cells, the T cells that HIV invades. Uh, therefore, the surface protein is exposed to the immune system, and therefore there is a selective pressure for these surface proteins to change over time. If a virus enters into a body and then uh, does not change its surface molecules, then after a while the immune system will recognize it and will kill off the viruses. So we will fit two alternative models to the HIV data that we have in our data set. Model 1, the first hypothesis we will consider about our sequences, uh, is one in which we have two different classes of codons with different DNGS ratios. Now, before I get started on explaining that, in principle, every single codon in a sequence probably has its own DNGS ratio. Okay, so there's likely to not be exactly the same selective pressure on every single codon in a sequence. So in principle, we could make a model where every single codon in the sequence would have its own DNTS ratio. But as I explained previously, more parameters will give you a better fit, but it might lead to overfitting. So therefore, we like to limit the amount of parameters we have in a model. One way of doing that is that instead of having every single codon be, have its own DNDS ratio, we instead divide them into a number of broad classes and say, okay, all of the codons that have, say, less than 0.5, we put them in that bin. All of the ones that have between 0.5 and 1, we put them in that bin, etc., etc. So this is the first model we will consider. That's a model where we have two such classes of codons with different DNDS ratios. One of the classes have a DNDS ratio that's less than 1, meaning there's negative selection going on. There's a larger DS than DN. These are codons that are uh, uh, negatively selected, meaning they are conserved positions in the protein. They will typically be codons that encode something that is important structurally for the protein to fold up a function. The second class of codons we will consider are codons that have a DNDS ratio of exactly 1. They are codons where it doesn't matter one way or the other. There's no fitness impact of changing them. They will be perhaps surface residues that do not interact with anything and are not important for folding. We will then fit this model to the data. Ahead of time, we won't know which codons are in what class. That's part of the aspect we will fit from our model fitting. Also, for the DNDS ratio less than one uh, codons, we don't know exactly what rate they have. That's something we will also fit from the data. That was model one. The second model we will fit to the data is like the first model, except it has an additional class of codons, a class of codons with a DNTS ratio larger than one, indicating positive selection. If we fit that model to the data, then some of the models that were previously presumably in the, in the DNTS equal one class will now be find, found perhaps to be in a DNTS, in a class of, of codons with a DNTS ratio larger than one. Again, we don't know ahead of time which codons go where. That's what we fit from the data. We don't know ahead of time <coughs> what the average DNDS ratio would be here, so that's also something we fit from the data. Once we've done that, <coughs> we have now the parameter estimates and the likelihoods for each of these two different models. We know how many parameters there are. So we can now use, for instance, a CAIG information criterion to compute model probabilities for these two models and see which of them is better. If model two, the one with the three classes, is much better than model one, then we actually have statistical evidence for positive selection. The most likely reason in the present data case, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, example here would be that positive selection occurs in those codons that are trying to escape the immune system. Okay, so codons that need to change in order to not be recognized by the immune system are those most likely to be under positive selection. In this case, that would mean that we would be looking for what we call epitopes, meaning the parts of a protein that are recognized by an antibody. Typically, finding epitopes is quite difficult. Experimentally, you will have to do all sorts of uh, work in the protein lab. But in this case, we can actually use clever 
model selection methods to just look at DNA sequences and infer something about protein structure and about selection and therefore about epitopeness of, of different parts of the protein. That's actually an extremely interesting way of using DNA sequences. So have fun with the exercise and uh, thanks for uh, being on this course.